this episode of the Naturist Living Show, Nudity in the Human Body. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Welcome to the first in a series of three episodes where we're going to explore our society's attitude towards the human body. My name is Stéphane Deschain. I'm your host for today's episode of the Naturist Living Show, and I'm also the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. I was going to make this one show, but I had so much material and it kept piling up and adding up that I realized that I had enough for three shows. So we're going to break this up over three different episodes. We're going to be exploring our society's attitude towards the human body and therefore uh, almost uh, directly uh, towards nudity. Um, and I say society, I mean Western society, and more specifically, the Anglophone North American society in particular, um, although that certainly stretches to most English-speaking countries. And because American in particular, uh, American television and movies are now shown all over the world in multiple languages, those attitudes are quickly spreading to other cultures as well, and we're seeing more and more of that repeated around the world. Um, you know, I often say that naturism is not about nudity, which always comes as a big surprise to the textile people out there who hear me make the comment. Um, naturists would probably be a little bit more familiar with that. Uh, certainly nudity is very important to naturism. And uh, it doesn't work without it. It's a very, very key tool to getting to that respect for self, respect for others, and respect for the environment. Um, and I won't go into that again because uh, if you want to hear more about that, I would suggest you listen to the episode titled Why Clothing Optional Doesn't Work, which we did uh, a few months back. But, um, you know, naturism is about respect for self, respect for others, and respect for the environment, specifically respect for the body. That's a huge problem in our society today. And uh, in Europe, going back to an earlier show that we did on nudism versus naturism in terms of terminology, in Europe, that's the difference between the two terms. Uh, we explained that in that show where uh, Europeans tend to view naturism as the philosophy of respect for self, respect for others, and respect for the environment, while uh, they view nudists as people who just like to take their clothes off, where the, the nudity is the, the key thing. But I don't think that's true for most people who call themselves nudists. Um, they see it as also a tool towards a goal of, of self-respect. And, uh, you, you know, a strip joint is about nudity. Uh, adult magazines are about nudity. People are going to those places or buying those materials because they're looking to see flesh. Naturism, we, we don't take our clothes off to show people and we don't go there to look at people. Um, we are nude for ourselves um, and we are nude as part of a, a strategy and sometimes a form of therapy to help us get over uh, all the hang-ups that are imposed upon us by our society. We certainly have, as a society, not as naturists, uh, as a society we have a conflicted attitude towards our own body. Um, it, it's it's almost schizophrenic in nature. I mean, we're talking about uh, nudity is about embarrassment, um, shame, um, uh, offending others, a power. Uh, you know, the, we, people who are caught nudes seem embarrassed by the fact people... The thought of being nude with your coworker means that they will somehow have power over you because they've seen you nude. You, it's a discussion I've had many times with people who haven't tried it, particularly with the media. When uh, one of the interesting situations we get at Bear Oaks is we get a lot of reporters coming try to write stories about naturism. And uh, when we discuss them taking their clothes off to fit in, if they're with coworkers, that comes up often as a theme. Um, the uh, The sense of embarrassment and somehow power that the other might have because they've seen you nude. I'm not sure what that is. As a naturist, it seems odd. And logically, I think they don't know what that is either. It's really a uh, an emotional 
uh, reaction. And that's very important to remember. And we'll talk in a future show about introducing people to naturism and how it's not about logic. Most people logically know that taking your clothes off uh, is not a big deal. It has no impact. It doesn't hurt you. Um, but emotionally, it's very, very difficult to do. And we'll dwell into that even more in the second part of this series. It's also about offending others, which is very strange. I'm not sure why nudity is offensive, but you hear that often. One of the strange situations that we could get into, um, at least in North America, or at least in Canada anyway, and in terms of the law, is that I can walk down the street uh, with a t-shirt that says obscenities about your mother, or I can yell swear words all day long as I run down the road, and uh, that's okay. It may not be socially acceptable, but certainly not illegal. But if I sit quietly reading the newspaper on a nice sunny day on my front porch wearing nothing, then I am so offensive as to risk being charged criminally for that simple little act. That body, my genitals, are ex incredibly upsetting to people, apparently. So much so that we need to protect people, not, not with a civil law, but an actual criminal law. And you wonder why that is. Why do we feel like it? Does any other animal feel shame at its own body, embarrassment at its own body, offense at seeing the bodies of others in its own species? Of course not. Um, I'm, it's not clear why we've developed that, but it's certainly a big part of our society today, and it, it doesn't make any sense. And ironically, our Western culture right now is simultaneously moving towards more nudity. You see it all over the media, and you see it all over um, shows and the celebrities, and yet more body shame. People, the fashion is for more exposure, and, but the body shame is even more powerful today about looking right and feeling right. And therefore, most people have this incredible contradiction where they want to dress like what they see on television, which is not real. What they see in the newspapers and magazines doesn't exist. The people on the billboards don't exist. Not in real life. But they're trying to reach those goals, and because they can't, they feel worse and worse about themselves. To make things worse, we're now actually dragging our children into it. Uh, we're sexualizing them and making them self-conscious about their own body. It's, uh, it, it's ironic because it's actually being uh, driven to a large extent by our fear that they will be harmed by pedophiles and other pe people who prey on them. It's our uh, absolute paranoia about uh, child pornography. And again, I won't dwell into that into details because uh, that's probably that's another show that we'll do in the future. It's on my list of things. Um, but there's no question that when I was young and growing up and you went to the beach, little girls that were four and five never had tops on. In fact, often they had no bathing suits when we were going to the beach. Today, that's unacceptable. In fact, if you probably had a little girl that's four or five years old without a top on, you might get dirty looks. You might get somebody speaking to you. And uh, so that view that the child is a, a, spot, a potential sexual object is new and I think is harmful because the children sense it. They become uncomfortable with their bodies. And certainly children are doing all kinds of things like having diets and uh, image issues and even anorexia at a very young age. Um, when, when you saw pictures of naked children... When in the 1970s, you thought, how cute. Nobody thought about sexuality. They thought, oh, isn't that sweet? Isn't that cute? Today, the first time that I mentioned to somebody that uh, we might take pictures of our children nude at Bear Oaks or other nature's vacations that we take, people say, isn't that against the law? Isn't that child pornography? Because there's a misunderstanding. What is pornography? And of course, what is sexual? Sexuality is in the mind of the beholder. So if you get turned on by feet, then the sight of bare feet is sexual. Pictures of bare feet would be your pornography. And we forget that the uh, offense, the sick mind, is in the person who views it. The pedophile is the one that sees it as pornography. We don't. As a society, we shouldn't, and we're starting to. But as individuals, we don't get turned on by pictures of naked children, just those with problems do, which means that for the rest of us, it is not pornography. We can't turn the victim into the criminal, which sometimes has been happening. 
You know, in mass culture, I mean, look at uh, the Janet Jackson incident in uh, 2004 at the Super Bowl. Her nipple was apparently exposed for nine sixteenth of a second, so I'm told. And I've seen it as a close-up blown up many times. And you can barely see it because, of course, she's wearing, if you remember, a ring, a nipple ring that surrounds and covers most of her nipple. All this on grainy television in a massive stadium. And yet as soon as it happens, people were tripping over themselves to make complaints in the United States. Over half a million complaints were received over this small incident, over a nipple. And the question is whether that should even be an issue. What we see in the mass media, uh, specific television, movies, etc., uh, is a cultural touchstone. You know, the, the, the big question always is, is it the cause or the reflection of uh, how we feel and how we act? And it's probably a little bit of both. Um, there's no question that the media tries to create programming that is relevant to what we're interested in to what is relevant to our interests and how we feel. But uh, they tend to amplify it. They tend to take our curiosity and our anxiety and play on them. And by playing on them and taking them to extreme, they're amplifying the reaction, in my opinion. Um, it can also lead to homogeneity in our culture. Um, whereas before, you know, the, before you had really mass media, even newspapers tend to be local. There was no long distance broadcast. If there was radio, the radio was also a local station. The uh, there was a lot more differences in people's attitudes and views depending on where they lived and their uh, community and how people felt about it in the community. Today, that's gone. It's not just countrywide. It's becoming worldwide because the American media in particular is so pervasive that you uh, see it in multiple languages and multiple cultures and it's affecting how people see themselves and feel about themselves and how they act. This program contains scenes of nudity and mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. This disclaimer is now the part of a lot of TV shows that uh, I watch these days. I didn't have to look long to find this one there everywhere. Um, some talk about violence. Uh, most are concerned about nudity and sexuality because, of course, we know that that's a much bigger concern, although nobody's ever been able to explain to me why, but it's a much bigger concern, especially with children, that they might see the human body nude than them seeing violence. Even the cartoons that my children watch are full of violence. It may not be blood and gore, but the violence is there and very real. They just clean up the violence so it seems less painful, uh, less damaging, that people don't die. They just get uh, destroyed and disappear. It's very clean, so there's less uh, disturbance, shall we say. I, I, I'm not sure that makes it any better. I think it makes the violence just okay. But the nudity is the one that's still particularly dangerous and scary to people, which is why it deserves this kind of warning. And I think in terms of cultural touchstones, the show Seinfeld, which it might shock you, but is uh, well over 10 years old now, uh, it, it ran from 1990 to 1998. And it had a very big impact on our culture. A lot of the expressions that we use um, day to day have uh, come from uh, Seinfeld. They had a big impact on how people communicated because it was such a popular show that everybody saw it. And therefore, a lot of the vocabulary they used enter the day-to-day -day usage. I mean, I just have to talk about soup Nazi, uh, no soup for you, master of my domain, uh, a close talker. You probably know what I'm talking about. Do you know what double dipping is? That's a very common one when you're going to parties now. No double dipping. That didn't exist as a term before. People didn't even think about double dipping, even though it probably shouldn't have been done then either. Uh, Regifting, that term didn't exist. It was invented by Seinfeld. Shrinkage, sponge worthy. I mean, I could go on. There's all kinds of terms like that that are part of our day to day expressions now that came from Seinfeld. And as everybody knows, Seinfeld was making fun of really everyday regular issues. So, was he laughing with us or was he laughing at us? Of course, many people took the lessons of this comedy, this parody, as the way life should be. And that's a little scary, and that's a little dangerous. It's not their fault. It was funny. It was a very funny show. But uh, 
was it really reflective of the times or did it create the times? It certainly reflected the way a lot of people feel today and the way a lot of people felt then. Does that make it right and acceptable? Or does that point out that there's something that we should be fighting? Let's take, let's take for example, the uh, from Season 5, Episode 20, uh, that was first broadcast in May of 1994. It was called The Hamptons. And in it, uh, George's girlfriend, um, uh, her name is Jane, and she's played by Melora Walters. Uh, she is uh, goes swimming or sunbathing topless, or top free, as we like to say, and is seen by all of the other members of the show. Well, this is interesting. What? Jane's topless. <laughs> yo, yo, ma. Boutros, Boutros, golly. Nice rack. So George is quite upset because, of course, everybody's seen his girlfriend nude before him. Yeah, I saw Jane topless. Well, we all saw her. <laughs> all right. You saw Jane topless? Well, when you went for the tomatoes, she lied out topless. Oh, you mean face down on a chest? No. <laughs> face up on her back? Yeah. Well, why'd she do that? Well, I guess she was hot. <laughs> you mean she just laid there topless? No, no, she got up. She walked around. Yeah. Walked around? <laughs> and you looked? Of course. She's got a great body, buddy. All right, I'm go upstairs. I'll be right back. Huh? I can't believe that you saw her before me. Think of me as a doctor. Well, how good a look did you get? Well, what do you mean? Well, if she was a criminal and you had to describe her to a police sketch artist, they'd pick her up in about 10 minutes. Great, great. So anytime you want, you can just visualize her naked. I guess that's true. Stop it. Stop it. This is not fair. It's not fair. I don't like this situation, Jerry. I don't like it one bit. But what do you want me to do? You want to see Rachel naked? Yes! Yes! Yeah, right. The punishment should fit the crime. You can see me naked. I could offer you that. It's like I'm Neil Armstrong. I turn around for a sip of tang, and you jump out first. So we can see that the fact that somebody sees someone else's nudity has elements of obviously power and possession and uh, control. Um, he feels uh, the need and he f spends the rest of the show trying to see uh, Jerry's girlfriend and sneaking in uh, the door when uh, and opening it, trying to find a way to open the door. <laughs> hey! Oh, sorry. Don't you knock? I'm sorry, uh... It's not like I'm going to see something I've never seen before. <laughs> you might have. I didn't. You won't. In the end, it's Jerry's girlfriend, Melanie, played by Melanie Smith, who sees George, played by Jason Alexander, nude, uh, by accident. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. I thought this was the baby's room. I'm really sorry. And following that comes one of the most interesting discussions of the show, where George... And Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld, played by Jerry Seinfeld, of course, and Elaine, played by Julia Louis-Dreyfus, have a discussion about the fact that George's penis was shrunk because of swimming. Hence the term shrinkage, which has entered our regular day-to-day -day vocabulary now. Do women know about shrinkage? What do you mean, like laundry? <laughs> no. Like when a man goes swimming afterwards? <laughs> It shrinks? <laughs> like a frightened turtle. <laughs> Why does it shrink? It just does. I don't know how you guys walk around with those things. Now, I'm sure that Julia Louis-Dreyfus had seen penises before and knew how they worked, but... It is not surprising that as part of this humor, a part of this 
parody and comedy, they would have this conversation because a lot of men and women don't know and understand each other. Is that right? Is that helpful? Does that help self-respect, respect for others, respect for the human body? Of course not. Is it typical? It probably is. Perhaps not to this extreme, but it shows you that it seems to be an acceptable part of the society that we don't understand each other's body parts, that we're surprised by it, not just offended, but they're part of the mystery because we don't talk about them. We don't show them and we don't talk about them because they are embarrassing. They are ugly sometimes, people would say, and uh, offensive. One of the later shows, in fact, in the last season, season nine in uh, 1997, episode number nine is called Apology. Oh, the part I'm talking about has nothing to do with the main storyline. It has to do with the fact that Jerry has a girlfriend named Melissa, played by Kathleen McClellan, who is described at times as a nudist because she spends all her time in Jerry's apartment completely naked. She ate breakfast naked? She didn't even want a nap. <laughs> I've had bedroom naked. I've had walk to the bathroom naked. I have never had living room naked. Oh, it's a scene. It's like you're living in the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> did she, uh, did she frolic? I don't really have enough room. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where they talk about good naked and bad naked. Coughing, naked. It's a turnoff, man. Everything goes with naked. When you cough, there are thousands of unseen muscles that suddenly spring into action. It's like watching that fat guy catch a cannibal in his stomach in slow motion. Oh, you spoiled, spoiled man. Do you know how much mental energy I expend just trying to picture women naked? But the thing you don't realize is that there's good naked and bad naked. Naked hair brushing good. Naked crouching bad. So the casual nudity makes Jerry uncomfortable. He's very uncomfortable with the non-sexual aspect because for us, of course, in our society, nudity is about sexuality only. It's not part of the regular human being that we are. That's to be hidden. The way we are, the way we, we move and react, the way our body is. So when people see it, they have this reaction of shock and surprise and disgust and sometimes course that's not right it's very odd but you can see it very well reflected in this episode oh great Elaine. what is wrong with my body chicken wing shoulder blades <laughs> that's it no but that's one problem why well i was walking around naked in front of melissa the Whoa. other day walking around naked uh, that is not a good look for a man <laughs> why not it's a good look for a woman female body is a, a work of art. The male body is utilitarian. It's for getting around. It's like a jeep. So you don't think it's attractive? It's hideous. The hair, the lumpiness, it's simian. Well, some women like it. Hmm. Sickies. So this neurotic uh, conflicted attitude towards the human body that's uh, well illustrated in those two um, Jerry Seinfeld uh, episodes is typical of how society works, how we view the human body, how we're taught to react to the human body. I mean, the human body is should be natural. Logically, we seem to agree, but emotionally, we all feel this. We all learn to react that way. Even naturists have to fight that urge to not have those reactions that have been emotionally programmed in us. A more recent show that I had the privilege, I guess. No, not so much a privilege. I, didn't re I don't care much for the show. It's called Dr. 90210. And this is current in that it is a uh, reality series that focuses on uh, plastic surgery in Beverly Hills. 90210 will be a familiar zip code for those of you who remember the series uh, of the spoiled teenagers that lived in Beverly Hills that uh, ran a while ago. So Dr. 90210 is a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon, or a number of them, but more specifically there's one called Dr. Ray and a few other supporting ones. 
And uh, it's produced by E! or Entertainment Television. But it's also broadcast on several other uh, cable channels. And uh, I was able to see it here in uh, Canada. Each episode is about uh, an hour long. But it's always about either the personal lives of these plastic surgeons, who are obviously quite well off doing all this surgery for these rich folks, um, but also the quote-unquote problems um, that these people have that they can solve. And it's a very, very sad situation. Uh, and it illustrates the problems in our society in so many, so many ways. Here's a, how I believe it's Dr. Ray describes what they do. Good to see you. How's the trip? Hi, yeah. That was good? good. To some degree, we're psychiatrists with knives. I sleep on my side. Is that side right? is fine. Yeah. Just don't lay on them for a week. Okay. After that, you're good to go, sweetie. Okay. Something happens, you roll over, it's okay. Studies show that we have as much cures in mild depression as psychiatrists do. Okay. Everything is ready to go. Thank you. But you're obviously a very, very, very... Psychiatrists with knives. I mean, that's unbelievable. I'm sure he believes it. I'm sure that people feel better about themselves. But the question is, why do they feel bad in the first place? Most of these people probably don't have anything wrong with them. I'm not saying that there is never a need for plastic surgery. People have horrible, disfiguring accidents that require plastic surgery to bring them back to a more normal state. But that normal should be a very wide range, and we've narrowed it down to a very, very limited and tight range where most of us don't fit into the, quote, normal standard. And here's one of the an example. Uh, here, Allison is getting ready for her surgery with the Dr. 90210 surgeons. Look, see the boat? Look, see the water? My name is Allison. I'm going to Dr. Lee to get breast implants, a tummy tuck, and lipo on my hips and my thighs. Um, and my husband is in Iraq. He's a Marine, and he'll be back at Christmas. So this is a big surprise for him. There you go. <laughs> so just to repeat, she's not just getting one area fixed. She's getting her breasts, hip, thighs, and a tummy tuck all done. And uh, you can't see this because it's audio only, obviously, but Allison is a very attractive woman from everything I can see. In, as she's playing with her children in the park in the video clip, I see nothing wrong. She may not have the largest breasts, but as we naturists know, there are no two pairs of breasts identical. Each person is unique, and each body is unique with different style and different ways that we're built, and we, we need to accept this. But shows like this point out that we, we can't. But of course, it's not the show's only fault. The show, in fact, is showing the lives of doctors who are, quote, helping people uh, with problems that were created by our societal attitudes toward the body. And uh, it's a real disease. I mean, uh, you know, breasts is just another example. We are obsessed with breasts. Take, listen to this part. People are obsessed with breasts, definitely in Los Angeles, but I think all over the world now. It's just becoming more acceptable to admit that you have breast implants or admit that you want them. It's normal. It's almost like buying a car. But I think the obsession with breasts have always been there. It was just more private before. I do think women with fuller breasts have an advantage over women who are flat-chested. And I know that having been completely flat-chested and getting implants, everybody in general is just nice. Of course, breasts, while they may be appealing to some people, well, they're certainly appealing to me. Um, it's not the only body part that appeals to me in a woman. And it's not that there's only one type that I'm attracted to. It's just part of our biological makeup. But more importantly, they are part of the woman. And their primary function, because we are mammals, and those are mammaries, is to feed children. That's why they exist. So... To focus so heavily on breasts looking a certain way and for people to actually have surgery, invasive surgery, because they don't think theirs are perfect, because they can't have the self-esteem and the confidence without that surgery, it's not 
that the doctors, the surgeons, are psychiatrists, is that the people should have the help ahead of time of psychiatrists, and that's where naturism sometimes can be a therapy, to accept who they are so they don't need the surgery. The surgery is a way of dealing with the problem by cutting it away or filling it in if, in case of breasts. But, I mean, if I was uh, angry with my arm for some reason in my deranged mind, the solution is not to cut off my arm. The solution is to help me deal with whatever the issue is I'm having with the arm. And the idea to have surgery to fix hips, thighs, tummies, breasts is ridiculous. It also fits right into our idea in society that there's an instant solution. You know, if we are obese and we want to lose weight, just cut it out or take a pill. Never mind the regular, ongoing, healthy living, healthy eating and exercise that we should do. So again, some people can use the help of a surgeon and a plastic surgeon. Some people do need medical intervention. But I would guess that 90% of them don't. The most interesting lesson, though, from Dr. 90210 comes with regards to how we deal with breasts and nipples and how women's nipples and women's breasts should not be seen. We know, of course, that the only thing that we actually have to hide are the nipples. You know, you only need to put pasties on them and then it's legal. Whenever there's a definition as to what is legal and illegal about breasts, of course, we don't think anything should be illegal. But where it is illegal, it is the nipple that is the most offensive portion of the breast and the areola area around them. Other than that, we're free to reveal the breast in uh, low-cut dresses and little bikinis and G-string bikinis. It's okay. In fact, it's encouraged. Again, here's that conflict. Show the body, but you don't look right, so you shouldn't show your body. Very confusing. But in this particular show, there was a man. Well, he was a man at this point. He used to be a woman. And through surgery, and there are certainly men and women that have some gender confusion issues, that have, uh, so they need to have a gender transformation surgery. And that's okay. So this woman became a man, and uh, he still had women's chest, women's breasts. So he was coming into a doctor, 90210 uh, surgeon, to have this part of the transformation done by operation. So as they were showing us the work they're going to do on this man, who honestly, to me, looked just like a man, he had... Uh, facial hair and uh, spoke like a man and acted like a man. Obviously, the medication and all the other surgeries had worked quite well. But when they took his shirt off and the uh, bandage that he was keeping around to hide the fact that he had female breasts, uh, they blurred it out. So clearly, those were female breasts and female nipples because breasts are okay, of course. And then the operation happened. And in the operation, we see in the actual operating room how they're cutting away at the breasts. The whole time in the video, the fuzz, the nipples are fuzzed out. There's a love so that we can't see those very upsetting and very offensive nipples. Now, a mere minute or two after that, now that they've removed material from inside the body, material that was never physically uh, visible to us because they were removing breast tissue inside underneath the skin. But once they've removed that material in the operation, which we're allowed to see, the cutting, the blood, the gore, that's not a problem. But all the time, the nipple is obscured. But as soon as that fatty tissue and, and breast tissue has been removed, suddenly the image is now clear on the video. <laughs> we're allowed to see the nipple. The same nipple, the exact same nipple that we could not see before. Because now it's a man's nipple. Showing really the ridiculousness of our attitudes towards men and women's nipples in our society. I couldn't think of a better example to rationalize and justify that women and men's nipples are no different and women and men's chest should not be treated any differently. In the show, there's another procedure which is very interesting. Listen to this. Everything's about symmetry. My name is Dr. Gary Alter. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon and board-certified urologist. 
I perform all kinds of plastic surgery. I perform a very discreet surgery on women that very few people will talk about. One of the surgeries I pioneered is a new technique of labia reduction surgery, which is surgery to reduce the size of the inner lips of the vagina. Amazing. So labiaplasty, what an interesting term. Uh, it's to increase their self-confidence. So they show this operation of the labiaplasty. They show the woman's legs spread apart and the surgeon working on her labia. Of course, the area of the labia that he's working on, well, the whole area, the whole uh, genital area, is again fuzzed out, obscured, so that we can't see it and be horribly offended by it. Obviously, we're choosing to watch this, but hey, we still need to protect it from, to be protected from ourselves. The woman's the woman's labia, of course, part of it is cut out. Large parts of it are cut out. And they put those on a tray next to the surgeon. And the camera zooms in. So the labia, now that it's detached from the body, is okay to look at. It's now the piece of flesh. When it was attached and alive, was offensive. But now, as a hacked up piece of flesh that's detached, is acceptable to view. It, I, I mean, I love this show for the fact that it's showing all of these contradictions, that it shows how irrational and, and warped our society is when it comes to our own bodies and how we feel about it. So I think these shows, this television, is really reflecting of the problems. Unfortunately, most people don't see these as problems. They're seeing it the way it is. They don't question. And that's where naturism comes in. It is our job as naturist to show the world how irrational and disturbed it is with regards to who we are and what we are. And it's our job to make sure people understand the damage that this is causing. Naturism is a better way. It is the way to bring ourselves back to being real human beings. So that's it for today's show. So listen in next time when we're going to be discussing more media and nudity in television, specifically with an angle on gymnophobia or gymnophobia, depending on whether you want to put the Greek uh, pronunciation to it, which is defined as the fear of nudity. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park, traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social, and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca.